Good morning, everyone. You are at, when you come to a fork in the road, take it, Yogi Berra's Guide to the Quantum World. Before we get started, I do want to give you one housekeeping announcement. Please, if you have cell phones or beepers, if you will turn them off or to silent mode, we'd appreciate it. This morning, I have the great pleasure of introducing Professor Ramamurti Shankar. He will talk for about an hour this morning, but one of the things that I wanted to mention in his introduction is that he was one of six Yale faculty members recognized just past, this past weekend as an outstanding teacher. And I want to read just the last line from his citation. For the clarity you bring to abstruse explanation and the care you offer undergraduates at every level, Yale College is proud to bestow on you the Harvard Burns Richard B. Sewall Prize. <laughs> Professor Shankar. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thank you all for coming here. And I promise you that uh, when it's your turn to give a speech, I will be there for you. <laughs> I learned this piece of etiquette from Yogi Berra. Yogi said, you should always go to other people's funerals or they won't come to yours. <laughs> so. Now, my reaction was the same as yours. You know, I thought it was hilarious. Same way I felt about coming to the fork and taking it. Till one day, it dawned on me that this is no laughing matter because this is exactly what particles like electrons do, according to the laws of quantum mechanics. When they come to the fork in the road, they take it. And that's what I'm going to be uh, uh, talking about to you today. Now, I said, OK, so this is one joke I shouldn't laugh at. That's fine. I picked up the pieces of my life and moved on. <laughs> then I went to the Yogi Berra website, which has got all the Yogi Berra jokes. Then I realized with a sinking feeling that every one of them expresses a basic physics truth, you know, one of the <laughs> fundamental laws of physics. <laughs> so what does that mean? That means no more laughing at Yogi's jokes. And once you stop doing that, there is not very much left in life to be amused by. <laughs> so that's the reason I've been downcast and depressed. Okay. <laughs> anyway, look, let's not, let's not talk about me. Let's talk about you. How do you like my lecture so far? <laughs> okay. Okay. Look, that, was, that was meant to be a joke. Anyway, um, I mean, let us talk about you, OK? I look at you people here, and I'm picking up enormous tension. You guys are thinking, you know, at 10.30 in the morning, this guy's going to talk about quantum mechanics. I'm not going to follow anything. I'm going to feel stupid. I don't need this. That's not why I came to the reunion. I wanted to tell my classmates I'm rich and famous and fabulously wealthy. So why feel bad at the reunion? So I'm going to put you at ease. Here is the thing I'm going to tell you that will calm you down, OK? I'm going to quote from Richard Feynman, who is one of the greatest scientists from our time. This is what he said about quantum mechanics. He said flat out, no one understands quantum mechanics. That's right. I don't, you don't, Maya, you don't, uh, Sophia, you think you do, you don't. Feynman doesn't. God, he or she doesn't. No one understands quantum mechanics. So. That's not going to change because of one lecture, OK? So I feel no pressure whatsoever to make sense. <laughs> and you don't have to understand anything I'm saying, because it's a lost cause even before we begin. So just relax and have a good time. Now you're saying, you don't know quantum mechanics, and we don't know quantum mechanics. So what's the big difference between us? The difference is, you don't understand quantum mechanics, and you have a good sense to keep quiet. <laughs> So I'm here trying to do something. But actually, that is a difference. I mean, the difference is I know how to use the laws of quantum mechanics to do a lot of calculations. 
you know, how do you take quarks and make neutrons and protons, and how do you take them and make nuclei, then atoms, then molecules, and solids, and liquids, and superconductors, semiconductors, even the formation of galaxies, they all require some knowledge of quantum mechanics. So, why not talk about that, that I know something? The problem is I've been told in the strictest terms that I cannot use any equations. I've been allowed two equations in this talk. So to talk about physics without mathematics puts me at a tremendous disadvantage. I feel like Bill Clinton at a convention for celebrates. <laughs> Everything I'm good at, I cannot invoke here. So what do I do? Actually, let me give you another example that makes more sense to Yaleys like you. Suppose you have to explain to somebody who has no concept of love or romance, what's so great about Romeo and Juliet? Okay? So I want you to imagine this person. No concept of romance, no concept of love. Let's say for definiteness, a physicist. Okay? <laughs> so you're standing there, and the physics guy comes along doing this, and you say, hey, physics guy, come here. Uh, what's with your hands? You learning rap music now? He says, no, I'm not rap music. I'm just remembering if the electron goes in this direction, the magnetic field points this way, forces in that direction. I never want to forget that. That's why my hands are always doing <laughs> Are you sure you don't watch MTV? No, I don't even have a TV. Uh, my parents bought me a TV to make me well-rounded, but I rewired it into an oscilloscope and took it to the lab. <laughs> so that's what you're up against. You've got to tell this person what is so remarkable about Romeo and Juliet. So you start out very nicely. You say, Romeo and Juliet were two young people who are in love. Physics person says, look, uh, love, I'm not familiar with that concept, so why don't we skip that and go ahead. You say, okay, uh, Romeo and Juliet have a certain attraction. Ah, attraction. So is it proportional to the product of their masses? <laughs> no, it doesn't seem to depend on how big the masses are, it's how they are shaped. That seems to make a bigger difference. <laughs> So it uh, looks like a communication barrier between you and the physicist. So you say, look, uh, Romeo and Juliet got a problem because they are, because of something. And as time goes by, something gets worse and worse. And eventually, uh, the mother doesn't understand, the nurse is an airhead, the padre doesn't have all the connections, the pharmacist messes up the prescription and everybody dies. So that's Romeo and Juliet if you're not allowed to talk about the central idea of romance. And that's my situation if I cannot use mathematics. So you will have to agree that I made a fairly good case for why I really should stop right now uh, <laughs> as a matter of principle. So if I was a matter of principle, I would go. See, that's not a problem right now. So I'm going to stick on because I found one loophole to the whole argument. Namely, it is true there's a lot of equations in physics, but physics is a theory of the real world as you and I see it. And often, statements are made which make perfect sense to the layperson. A lot of time, physicists use words like energy and force and momentum. They mean something else to them than to you. But there are some physics statements which mean exactly the same thing to me as they mean to you. There's no compromise when you talk about those. And some of them are pretty surprising. I'm going to talk about one such statement from quantum mechanics, which I think I can communicate to you without any dilution. But first, I want to give you an example of what I mean by these ideas. So let's take one example from thermodynamics. So you take a glass of water at room temperature, and if you want to cool it down, you put it in the fridge. And if that's not cold enough, you put it in the freezer. You can keep on lowering the temperature. Zero degree centigrade is not a barrier. We all know we can go below that. So you might think, I can keep on cooling things to minus 100, minus 200. Centigrade, that would be correct. But when you said minus 300, that would be wrong. Because that is a lowest temperature, which is minus 273 point something, that you cannot go below. Now that means the same thing to me as it means to you. There is a lowest limit to the temperature below which you cannot go. And that's a bit of a surprise, because you might think maybe one day we'll build better refrigerators and we can beat that. You cannot. Now the details are in physics, but the statement is fairly simple, and it's the way I explain it to you. Another such thing that says you cannot do something comes from relativity. And it has to do with the velocity of light. The velocity of light has occupied humans for a long time. For example, Alfred E. Newman, who wrote his great thoughts in Mad Magazine, said, this much I know about the velocity of light. 
It gets here too early in the morning. <laughs> now, less profound statement came from Einstein, who said, nothing can travel faster than the velocity of light. Now, that means exactly what you think it means. What Einstein is inviting you to do is to look around the world, look at anything that's moving, okay, bullet, car, Superman, a piece of gossip. You would just find out how quickly it travels, and you will never find anything traveling faster than the velocity of light. Okay, the fact is there's an upper limit to the velocity, but you should not accept that so easily because you might find ways to beat the system. For example, if I told you the highest velocity is the velocity of sound, it's like 750 miles per hour, you can think of the following way in which you can beat that. You can come to me and say, listen, uh, can I build an airplane that goes at 500 miles an hour? Yes, you can because it's below this supposed limit. Can I build a gun whose bullets come out at 500 miles an hour? Again, the answer is yes, that's less than 750. But then you say, what if I get into this plane and I point the gun to the front of the plane and fire the bullet and you're looking at me from outside, what will you see? Well, I'll see a bunch of air marshals jumping on you, but the next thing I'll see, <laughs> I'll see a bullet going at roughly 1,000 miles per hour. So that's, you would be right. Uh, the velocity of sound can be beaten the way I told you, by taking two velocities, less than the limit, putting them one on top of the other. So why don't you do this with light? So you can say, can you build a plane that goes at three-fourths the velocity of light? And I'll say, they haven't built it yet, but it's possible. There's no law against that. And can I build a gun whose bullet goes at three-fourths the velocity of light? That's allowed too. So what if I go into this plane and I find this bullet, and you see it from outside, you should be seeing something moving at one and a half times the velocity of light. Well, there you would be wrong. So it's not that three-fourths plus three-fourths is not one and a half. That's correct. That's the way numbers add. That's not the way velocity is at. For small velocities, you put one on top of the other, they just add simply. For bigger velocities, as you approach the velocity of light, the answer is always somewhat less than what you thought. And if you go back to this experiment with the bullet and the plane, the answer will always come out to be less than the velocity of light. So that's a little more technical, but the statement is surprising and true, that you can never beat this velocity. And it's not a huge infinite velocity, it's a finite number, and you cannot go faster than that. So, does quantum mechanics tell you there are certain things you thought you could do, but you cannot? And the answer is yes. In fact, it forbids so many things, it's like a religion. But I'm going to pick on one thing it says you cannot do. That has to do with attributing trajectories or paths to particles. Let me explain what I mean. So imagine, in my left hand, I have an electron source, okay? It's emitting electrons. So it emits an electron, and I, I know it did because I feel the recoil in this hand. Then in my right hand, I have an electron detector. When an electron hits that, it goes click. So it was here, then it was here. The question is, what do you think happened in between? The safest thing to say is, look, it followed some path. Maybe it went in a straight line. Or if you're worried about gravity, like a football, it went up and came down. And it turns out that that is wrong. It is wrong to believe that the electron went from A to B along any particular path. When no attempt is made to see it, you cannot assume it had any trajectory between the two points where you actually saw it. Now, this is very strange because suppose you're watching a football game and you saw the quarterback throw the football. It goes up in the air and you're distracted for a while. You look that way or this way. And then you suddenly see the receiver receiving the football. Do you really think that the football didn't have a trajectory just because you were not looking at it? You know it had a trajectory. You will say, look, I have it on tape. The whole thing went like this. There you would be right. The reason you would be right is, even though you didn't look at the football, a lot of other people were. There were lights in the stadium shining on it. There were cosmic ray particles bouncing off the football. The world is in contact with the football constantly, locating it here and here and here. You're just connecting the dots. That is perfectly okay. But I'm telling you, in the case of the electron, if you promise me that no contact is made with the electron, you cannot assume it went from A to B along any path whatsoever. You cannot attribute any one single trajectory that you can say it took. So your reaction may be, look, let's agree to disagree on this, okay? You don't believe in trajectories between observations? I do. 
what is the big difference? What difference is it going to make? The difference is that if you believe in trajectories when you have no real reason to, you will eventually make a prediction that will disagree with experiment. Now, that is an absolute no no in the physics world, okay, it is not allowed. Now, you look at physicists, you know, they do not seem to care about anything. They wrap a piece of cloth around their neck one day and say, that is my tie, and they wrap it around the waist the next day and say, that is my belt. Uh, or they wear socks that don't match. I am talking about stylish physicists who wear socks. So, it seems to be a world where anything goes. That is very true. We are very laid back on these matters. But one principle that we all swear by is if you make a prediction that does not agree with the experiment, you are out. It does not matter what your name is, it does not matter how famous you are. And I am telling you that is what is going to happen to you if you believe in trajectories when you have no reason to. So, I am going to now describe to you an experiment where the assumption of trajectories when no observation is made will lead to a prediction that is flat out wrong. Now, that experiment is what is called a Gedanken experiment, it is a German word for thought experiment. That means this is not exactly how the experiment is done, but it is a stripped down bare bones version of the experiment where the main points are highlighted with great clarity. So, Einstein was a real expert in Gedanken experiments. All of us are becoming ex experts in thought experiments because we do not have money for real experiments. <laughs> but now, I am going to tell you the one thought experiment. So, do not think of a thought experiment as a fake. It, is, it can be done in principle in a lab, but I am showing you the simplest version so you see the main points. This is the experiment is actually uh, used constantly by Richard Feynman, the person I talked to you about earlier. So, let us start with the first experiment. So, take your time to look at this uh, picture here. This is a top view of an experiment, okay. Looking at the experiment from the top, on the left is an electron gun. It emits electrons, just like the gun in your television, okay. You know, in the television, the electrons are emitted with electron gun, they go hit this screen and it glows, and you watch your favorite soap opera as the stomach turns. Okay. This is the same thing with two differences. Okay. First difference is this electron gun emits few electrons per minute. If you want one per minute or one per second, that is why it is a thought experiment, it does not matter. In principle, we can have it that way, we will make it emit one per second. Secondly, the manufacturer guarantees that all the electrons coming out of this have the same speed or if you like the same momentum. Momentum is just the mass which is some fixed number times the speed. Okay, that is what you have here, electron gun with these two properties. In the other end of the room against the back wall, you have an electron detector. If an electron ever hits the detector, it will go click. Now, you can do this experiment in two ways, either you can have just one detector and move it back and forth to different locations and see what happens or you can put a whole bunch of detectors along this wall. You can imagine it either way. Now, between the source of electrons in this detector of electrons, there is this partition impermeable to electrons except for these two slits S1 and S2. Okay, so, you emit them here, they presumably take this path through this one or that and they land there. All right, so, let us do the experiment first by blocking this slit S2 and you have only this guy open and you move the detector back and forth and you plot this graph here. I want to make sure everyone knows how that graph is to be read. So, let us take our time figuring that out. If I sit here with the detector, every time I get an electron, I put an x there. I am planning to hold the detector in one location for a fixed amount of time, say one hour. So, I got that many x's, so the graph has that height. So, height is usually measured vertically in all the graphs you have seen. I have to draw it horizontally just because the way the, the way the picture is. If I go to that location, that is the measure of how many electrons I see. So, it is a pretty dull portrait of what happens. Basically, there are more coming in front of the hole and not many when you go too far off, but I am going to assume it is pretty much constant in front of the screen. Okay, so, now I am going to repeat the experiment, this time with this guy closed. What happens? It is the same plot is shifted to front of this hole. There is nothing dramatic in anything I have said so far. This is roughly what anybody would expect 
if instead of using electrons you were using bullets and firing them through a concrete wall with two holes in it this is what will happen. But now I am going to come to the key part of the experiment I am going to open both the slits and I am going to pick a location a particular location that I call x in my plot that is where you got 5 electrons when this one was open and 5 electrons when only that one was open. The question is what do you expect to happen in this location when both are open. Now, if you have not read the book and if you have not seen the movie you are just thinking on your feet what is your answer going to be. There is only one answer anybody can give based on common sense or based on Newtonian mechanics that is you should get 10 and your reasoning is look some guys went this way some guys went that way for the electrons going this way it makes no difference whether the other slit is open or not. So, they will keep doing business as usual here and there and the sum should be 10, but the answer is that you get no electrons at this location x. If I block this slit you start getting 5, if I block that slit you get 5, if I open both you get nothing. So, if you want to stare at the face of quantum mechanics and say what is the heart of quantum mechanics tell me something I have not heard before what is the mystery this is the mystery of quantum mechanics. We know how to do the math, but we do not understand it any more than you do in the in terms of daily experience. How can opening another slit reduce the count here does not make any sense, but this is the experimental problem we are dealing with and you notice that the prediction of 10 came from your Newtonian prejudice the particles had a trajectory right let me show you in the next one either they go like this or they go like this and if you are planning to go this way the electron does not even know there is a second slit see they, they do not have any eyes or brains or anything there is a little guys going in a straight line till they bump into something. So, they do not know about this slit so it can make no difference to the electron headed for this slit that there is a slit here. So, the number has to be additive you got to get 10. Now, you might say maybe when both slits are open the guy is coming from here bump into the ones coming from here and that is probably why nothing comes there that looks like a bit of a accident. So, to put an end to that objection I will reduce the rate at which electrons are emitted here. So, that at a given time there is only one electron in the whole room it is not going to bump into itself it just take longer, but you take wait longer and you get this behavior that with two slits open nothing comes there that is the end of Newtonian mechanics because in Newtonian mechanics particles follow trajectories and they have this trajectory and that trajectory and when two trajectories are possible you add the numbers because they go either this way or that way. It is hard to imagine that an electron going this way has any knowledge of another slit that is the whole point and yet it seems to because when you open two slits nothing comes there ok. This is why we have to abandon Newtonian mechanics I told you earlier you make a prediction and it is wrong you are out that goes for Mr. Newton this is the prediction of Newtonian mechanics. So, it is wrong so, you got to ask yourself uh, what happens when you close the slit I told you suddenly you get 5 if you open both you get nothing. So, now I am going to talk about the new theories of quantum mechanics you try to make sense out of this funny business you try to say what is happening the most famous theory is a conspiracy theory due to Oliver Stone. Okay. According to Oliver Stone, electrons are not stupid little things, they know what is going on, they are telling each other, you know what, when this guy opens both the slits, nobody go there, ok. <laughs> we will just mess with this guy, we will mess with his brain. That is a very good theory, but the article has not been published yet, it has been with the journals for a long time. So, I am going to wait till that is settled. In the meantime, I will give you something more mundane, which is the party line this is what the establishment has to say about this experiment ok that is really the quantum mechanics mainstream. So, in order to proceed here is what you do I told you there is one place where nothing comes where you expect a 10 you can imagine if I went to some other place maybe I will get more than I expect that is really what happens. So, here is what happens if you move your detector all the way from one end to the other sit patiently at each point and take the count this is the point marked x where nobody came the other places where this dotted line is obtained by adding the numbers you got from this to the number from that that is a Newtonian expectations the solid line is what you see 
some places you get less than you should, some places you get more than you should. But the most dramatic part of this is that opening a second slit can kill the number here. So, it is very hard to understand in terms of particles how a second slit can make a difference, but this pattern it turns out is a rather familiar pattern from some other part of physics which you may have seen in your days at Yale that has to do with waves. So, this is a throwback to your uh, physics 101 or whatever you took in your youth on wave theory, but it is mercifully going to last only about 5 minutes. I am going to tell you something about waves that we need to follow what is happening. So, think of this as a tank of water that you are seeing from the top and waves are being made here by something that maybe vibrates up and down. Normally, waves from a source will look concentric, but if you go far from it, they will look like parallel lines. So, what should you know about waves? Well, if you put your eye in level with the water and you look right at eye level, sometimes the water is up and sometimes it is down and up and down. This wavelength is defined as the distance from one up to the next up, that is a symbol lambda. Another thing you should know about waves is amplitude. Amplitude is a measure of how high the water went or how low it went, it is a positive number. Amplitude is 6, it means the water goes up by 6 inches at the highest point and goes down by 6 at the lowest point. These are two things you should know about waves. So, these waves come and they hit that uh, slit, double slit. Okay. Look, I spent a lot of time on PowerPoints. So I am going to make you watch this. <laughs> this is what the waves do. Okay. All right. We all know you feel my pain. Okay, good. When you are done PowerPoint, it is pain. So, this is what it is. The waves come and hit the slit. Let us see what is going to happen. Okay, we block that slit here when we just open this. But the waves will come out of this slit and they will hit this wall and here I have a detector. So, how do you detect water waves? Well, you take a long rod and put a piece of cork on it. So, it can jump up and down on the piece of cork and when the water goes up and down this guy goes up and down see like that <laughs> like that. So, what you do is you move from place to place and you note the amplitude. In other words, if it jumps up and down by 4 inches, you measure 4 inches like that and mark it there. So, this is not a graph of the water height, water on the average is flat. This tells you by how much it goes up and down at each point. So, this is not very surprising if you are sitting in front of the hole, then the vibration is the most, it sort of falls off to either side. Now, we will open the other slit and the pattern is the same except it is peaked in front of that one. Now, I am going to open both the slits and ask what happens if I sit at a certain location and this is what you will get. There are places like this where you used to get some signal, but you get nothing when you got a second slit open. So, in the case of waves, it is not so counterintuitive that opening a second slit can actually kill all the action at certain places. Why is that? Because unlike particles, where the number coming out of this and that are both positive numbers, you, you got to add them, they cannot cancel each other. But what is coming from here and here in the case of waves is a signal that tells the water to go up and down. When the blue thing hits you, you are up, when the red thing comes and hits you, you go down, you can go up and down. But this second slit is also telling you to go up and down. Now, if you are at some place right down the middle, you will get signals from the both of them at the same time. They will both tell you to go up and they will both tell you to go down the water will be extremely choppy there, but you can find some places off center. So, that this is a little shorter than this. So, by the time the signals go from here to here, they are no longer in step. Then it can happen that when this one tells you to go up that will tell you to go down. Here is a more detailed example. I am am I showing you the crest and trough and crest and trough as they march from this slit to where you are and from this slit to where you are. You can see they started out together but when you come here, they are exactly out of step. And one way to say that is that they are half a wavelength out of step. Because if you look at these waves, if you move exactly half a wavelength, a, a positive signal is reversed into a negative one. So, so, two signals which are half a wavelength out of step will always cancel each other. So, in wave theory, it is no big mystery that the wave knows there are two slits open. See, particles go through only one slit they do not know if the other one is even there let alone open or closed, but the wave is everywhere see it hits the entire front and it hits both the slits. So, it knows how many slits there are. 
Therefore, in wave theory it is not a mystery that opening a second slit can actually cut down the number there. Okay. So, go back to the experiment with electrons. Remember I told you if you did this experiment for a long time and did your little histogram you get this wiggly pattern. Now, from this pattern here by seeing how rapidly it wiggles here you can easily calculate the wavelength of the stuff coming here. And that wavelength if you determine it from experiment has the following form. Mass is the mass of the particle, V is the velocity. This combination is called momentum. The number on top is called Planck's constant. That has a value of 10 to the minus 34. Now, the first thing you should tell me is how come they gave you a teaching price if you do not know that you got to have units next to an answer like that. Right? 10 to the minus 34 what? BTUs per pound per square foot, you got to put some units, right? But I am not going to put any units because 10 to the minus 34 is a really small number, ok. It does not matter what. For example, <laughs> suppose you tell your buddies, you know, uh, since I graduated, I have made 10 to the 34 units of some currency. I do not care if it is yens or dollars, you are in good shape. I am not worried about you, right? So, likewise, 10 to the minus 34 is so small. All you have to notice is that if you put it at the bottom any reasonable number like one, ma one kilogram mass moving at 1 meter per second, you will get a wavelength is that really, really small. That is all we need to know. But when you do the same thing with the electron, the mass is so small this wavelength is not so absurd. It becomes a reasonable number and some of the interesting things that I am going to talk about happen. So, what you have to remember at this point is if you did that double slit experiment with electrons, you will find that this pattern you get here is created by some wave whose wavelength is given by this formula. That constant is the new physics, that is the new stuff of quantum mechanics. So, I am going to show you another way to understand this wiggly pattern using the trick not waves as I told you directly, but by some trick used by Feynman it has got the same basic point. But to do that I have to tell you something about arrows. We are going to learn today how to add arrows. Okay. This green arrow and red arrow are two arrows and we want to ask how to combine them. Suppose you tell me you know you went to a camp and on the first day you walked 4 miles from the camp. Next day you walked another 4 miles. How far am I from the camp? I say that you cannot really answer that question. It is not really 8 miles because you could have gone to the east one day and back west the next day in which case you are back where you started <laughs> or even more complicated you can start this direction one day 4 miles and the next day you go there then the distance you travel is this. So, the proper way to find the bottom line when your motion is described by an arrow is to add them according to this rule. You draw the first arrow for the first day and when you are done you start the second one and the bottom line is in the beginning of the first one and ending of the second one. You agree it is a reasonable way to add arrows whereas numbers they are added simply arrows have a direction. So, you got to know what is the direction of this arrow relative to that before I can tell you what the bottom line is. So, in particular if the first arrow was to the right that say you went east the first day the next day you went west the bottom line is 0 because you never went anywhere. This is all you need to know about adding arrows. I am going to come to this experiment here. This is I am going to tell you now Feynman's rule for how to calculate the answer for this experiment how to get this wiggly pattern. Here is the rule. Now, all of quantum mechanics is a bunch of rules. You cannot say why is it like this and why is it like that. We do not have any deeper understanding. We are pleased we know at least what it will do, ok. We are pleased to know the recipe and that is all it is. So, here is the recipe to find out in this experiment how should I get this wiggly pattern. Feynman's rule is the following you first draw all the paths the particle can take from start to finish, which in this case happens to be through slit 1 and through slit 2. For each slit it could take, I am going to assign an arrow of length 1 and I am going to add the two arrows from the two slits and then the total length of the sum is going to be a measure of the likelihood of finding the electron here. So, let us take this example. You take this point here in the middle symmetric between them, the arrow due to the first path is the brown arrow, arrow due to the second path is the red one is the green one and their sum we learned is twice as long. Now, you can say who told you to add them parallel maybe they are at some angle. So, I am coming to that. The rule is 
if the two paths are equally long you add the arrows together, but take a point here off center this is shorter than this by some amount right. Then the rule is their arrows no longer are parallel, but they have an angle between them as shown on the circle here. How much angle should I leave between the two arrows and the rule is if that length and that length differ by half a wavelength where the wavelength is given by the formula I told you they will differ by half a circle. If they differ by quarter wavelength they will differ by quarter of a circle which is 90 degrees. So, basically as you move up and down this line one path may change length the other will change length the two arrows will move in opposite directions. So, if you come to some other point like this you see the two arrows are not parallel and their sum which I have shown you here is this red arrow not as long as this red arrow. But you can go further up to this point where now the arrows one has moved to the 12 o'clock position other has moved to the 6 o'clock position because this path is shorter than this path by half a wavelength then the two arrows completely cancel each other. You go further up you can find another point where they line up one more time and cancel and line up and cancel and line up. So, it will you can also get the same answer by going to a textbook on waves and say if you got waves of some wavelength lambda tell me what will happen here you will read it off, but I want to do it this way the way Feynman told us to do it for the following reason because this is the fork electrons come to this fork they got to go this way or that way and they take it because you get contribution from both the paths. If you just took one path you will never understand why the number goes up and down, but the Feynman's rule is if you got two paths give each path an arrow of length one and add them according to this rule. So, this is what Yogi Berra was trying to tell the press on how to do quantum mechanics the minute he said when you come to the fork you take it they all started giggling and ran off to publish it and no one understood how to do quantum mechanics the so Feynman had to invent it all over again a few years later ok it could have been saved a lot of trouble if you gave the man the attention he deserves, but this is the fork ok. This is the sense in which particles go in both possible ways. Now, this does not make complete sense in terms of daily thinking I mean things do not really go through two ways it is a mathematical rule and you can associate any picture you want the mathematics says if you want to get the right answer you got to consider both paths namely an arrow for each and you got to add them if you do not add the two arrows you do not get this oscillation here. If you want to think of them as going through two paths that choice is yours, that is a matter of semantics this is really what happens. So, now when this experiment was discovered or described a lot of people said we do not buy this fact that electrons can go through both the paths at the same time, we are going to beat the system we are going to put a bulb here so that it will shine light on it and I can see which way these little guys went right they will bounce off light will bounce off this one or this one and I will know each time which path it took in which case you cannot avoid the conclusion that the number must be additive instead of oscillating. So, that is the experiment you put a light bulb here and you shine light on it and every time you register something you say that is from slit 1 any time you saw something here you say that is from slit 2 you got to add the numbers. What happens when you do the experiment is the following suppose 100 electrons went today you caught 80 of them those 80 you caught you can tabulate as coming from here and there their total will be this solid line here, but the 20 that you missed they will produce the tiny oscillation with the 20 percent contribution to this big graph. In other words the electrons whose trajectory you located by actually catching them they do have trajectories. Electrons that you could not catch during the transit you cannot assume they have a trajectory because if you took the view that it went this way or that way there is no avoiding the fact the number has to add up there is no room for getting less at one place by opening two slits ok. So, this is the main point that if you have no observation you have no trajectories. Now, why is it such a big deal to make this observation after all right now you are looking at me and I am looking at you I am being bombarded by millions of light particles right and I am taking it like a man not complaining, <laughs> but that is not the way electrons are because for electrons this tiny particles of light called photons look like 300 pound gorillas because they carry roughly the same momentum as the electron. So, that interaction when a particle of light bounces off the electron is pretty traumatic and violent event. So, the very act of observing the electron is what changes the result of the experiment. We are used to the view that whether you observe it or not it does not matter 
actually every time you make an observation you are sending some particles of light called photons they bounce off the football and they come back to your eye and you know where it is but it does not alter the trajectory of the football in any way. But for electrons the encounter with light is big because they are all objects of the same dimension and same scale. So that is why it is consistent logically to say when you make an observation you will get one answer if you miss the electron namely your photon did not hit it so it went by without being caught those electrons which were went unobserved behave as if they saw both the slits as if they came through both the slits ok. So, this is the remarkable part about the quantum theory. So, Yogi had some comments on this he said uh, you can see a lot by just observing. <laughs> now, the fact that particles can take two paths at the same time you realize that is giving anybody who hears about it an opportunity to get out of various tough situations. So, I happen to be privy to a certain conversation that took place between a very famous politician and an anchor man who was interviewing him. Uh, that episode of 60 minutes was not published because it is too hot for them to handle, but I got the transcript. So, it goes something like this uh, Mike Wallace is telling Bill Clinton. So, Mr. President uh, tell me when you went from the Oval Office to the other room did you go through door 1 or door 2 because no matter what your answer is you are in trouble. So, the president says you know it all depends on what you mean by going through this door and going through that door. <laughs> well, why do not you use whatever definition you want because you are in trouble. Well, in that case I will use the definition from an arcane branch of physics called quantum mechanics invented by Al Gore also in <laughs> inventor of the internet. Uh, this is what Al tells me Al says I can tell you I went through both the doors. Now, what are you going to do? So, what is wrong with the claim that the president can go through two doors you do not see that happening every day why is it is ok for electrons that is what I want to explain to you. Why is it the world behaves in the strange way when you talk about tiny things behaves in the normal way when you talk about big things. So, I am going to do a new experiment in which the electron is replaced by a new particle it weighs 100 kilograms the identical particles 100 kilograms are constantly going to be emitted and sent through a double slit to see what happens. So, these particles now they are new so we have to give them a name names like proton and photon are all taken I have a new name for this object uh, the object is going to be called a clinton <laughs> this is an experiment with clintons ok this is my source produces identical 100 kilogram clintons and they go to the double slit and you should see this pattern and if you see the pattern it means the person really took both paths that is correct. So, why do not you see that? Well, there are two reasons you do not see that. The first is in order for the electron to do this we all agreed it should not be observed if you put a light bulb it shines on it it is off this pattern is very fragile in order to see it nothing should come in contact with the electron. Now, it is possible in the case of an electron in a tiny region of space comparable to an atom to go from A to B without running into anything, but that is not easy if you are a 100 kilogram president you're always running into something cosmic ray particles, interns, various things moving around the White House you do not know what you will bump into. So, those big objects can never be really isolated, but if by some magic you are surrounded by secret service agents and they are willing to take all the cosmic ray particles for the chief you go from A to B without being observed then in fact you will form this pattern you will have come through both the slits. But the reason you never see that in real life is if you look at the wavelength that you will get using the formula lambda is Planck's constant divided by mass times velocity you will get something like 10 to the 34 meters centimeters whatever. These oscillations are so tiny that if you build a detector as big as the proton about a trillion of them will fit into that. So, your detector moving up and down cannot detect this pattern it will only detect the average and that will look just like Newtonian physics. That is the reason why macroscopic objects do not exhibit this strange behavior because the wavelength is too small and also it is hard to do an experiment where nothing comes into contact with them. All right, so we have managed to explain everything why big things behave the way they do and small things behave the way they do. So, why is this constant complaining about we do not understand quantum mechanics? Why are people like Feynman saying that? They are saying that because if you really look at what we can do, we have some reason to be happy and some reason to be very unhappy. We can in fact nowadays predict that if you do an experiment with electrons of a known momentum what this pattern is going to be like. 
because I told you the trick either you take a textbook on waves and put that lambda there or add the two arrows to the two paths you will get that answer. Why are we unhappy? We are unhappy because this graph tells you that if you send a million electrons and you did the plot, the plot will do this. What about the million plus one electron? When you send it what is it going to do? You really do not know. You can only say that the odds of finding the electron somewhere in the back wall look like this. So, it is a statistical prediction. It is not a deterministic prediction and that is why people feel very dissatisfied with quantum mechanics. You have done you have got maximum allowed knowledge the way you start the experiment and yet you do not make a definite prediction you only give the odds of something or other happening. That is the reason people do not feel very happy about this thing. Another thing you got to remember is if the pattern looks like this and you manage to catch the electron here it is wrong to assume it was there before you even saw it. Electron did not have a definite location till you measured the position of the electron. The electron was in a strange state of affairs in which it could have been anywhere on that given day at the given time and it is only the act of measurement that nails down the position of the electron till then it does not have a position and the odds of getting this or that answer are given by this wiggle. So, people are always saying is the electron a particle or a wave you know give me a straight answer. Well, you cannot do that first of all why should it be anything right you got to take things as they come why should it fit into this mold or that. So, the proper answer would be electrons are like particles in the following sense whenever they hit a detector in the back wall they hit only one detector they do not it is not like a wave that hits the whole shore it is like a bullet that hits one thing they dump all their charge all their mass all their attributes into the one little detector in that sense they are particles and yet the way they go from here to there cannot be computed using any trajectories you got to draw this wave and see how it interferes and what pattern it forms and that gives you the odd. So, you need the wave to do the prediction of where it will land, but when it lands on your head it is like a particle that is what it is you can call it what you like, but trying to pigeonhole the electron is a waste of time these are its properties under these conditions. So, Yogi Berra had something to say about this uh, particular thing about how hard it is to make predictions there is uh, tough to make predictions especially about the future. <laughs> All right. So, now I want to talk a little bit about the notion of uh, probabilities in quantum mechanics. I told you predictions are probabilistic, but that is not new right you go to Vegas or something you are relying on probabilities. Why is this so bad in quantum mechanics your probabilities the answer is when you go to Vegas you know somebody is doing a trick for you with a pack of cards shuffling them you got to guess what is on top ok it is going underneath his hand and you reveal the card by opening and showing the color this is a case where there are two reds and a black. So, the odds are one third it will be black. So, you can place your bets accordingly suppose the person shuffles them a few times and then removes his hand and you see the black is there that is fine, but here is the interesting thing even though you gave odds of one third for the black on that given day during that particular shuffle if the guy got the black card on top it in a real sense was black even before you moved his hand and saw what was underneath it was in a state of definite color namely black on another shuffle maybe it is red, but in each shuffle there is an answer that we believe is really there even before we look at it, but we give odds because we do not know what is going on behind the hands or when you throw the die you give the odds for getting any number from 1 to 6 if it is loaded the probabilities may not be equal, but by playing with it enough times you give the odd. But when you throw the die on a given day if you really knew exactly how you release the die and how your hand re released it with what velocity with what angle there is only one answer that day the die has to land on a particular face and no other. You give odds as a matter of convenience because we do not want to go through the details of calculating that path in quantum theory there is no such thing you give odds because you cannot do better you cannot be certain on any given day what answer you will get. So, I want to tell you a little more uh, here is an example of somebody who's observed me for some time and plotted where I am. So, this is where I live 10 miles from work that is this route 10 I drive there then I am at Yale. So, you study me many times and you do a histogram that is what it looks like. So, the probability of finding me is smeared all over here 
I am myself not smeared all over okay unless I had some violent accident in route 10 I am usually in one place. So, what is spread out is simply your knowledge about where you will find me. So, if you try to locate me by calling my cell phone I pick it up here well I am there, but you believe that on that day I was only in that one place I was not anywhere else, but if you do the same thing and apply this to an electron and imagine these are two nuclei and the electron is either here or there is given by this probability graph for the electron if you look at it of course, you will find it in one place, but it is wrong to assume that because you found it there it was actually there even before you found it. Before you looked for it it was in this state of being where in principle it could have been here there or any other place where the function is not 0. That is a state of existence that has no analog in your daily life. So, do not beat yourself and say what does he mean that state of being is not found in the macroscopic world. In the macroscopic world you give odds, but things are always doing only one thing at a given time of the many things they could do they are doing one thing. The quantum particle is doing many things at the same time. How can that be well that is a state of existence to which there is no analog in daily life. I prepare for you an electron in a certain configuration I cannot tell you exactly where it will be found because it does not have a location till you measure it ok. So, here is another example this electron that I told you has no real brains no attributes nothing it is got one feature called spin you can imagine it as spinning either clockwise or counterclockwise like the earth or the opposite way. Now, an electron can be found spinning this way which is usually called up that means clockwise when you curl your fingers around it or spinning the opposite way which we call down. If someone sends you an electron in a box and you look at it and see what is the spin doing is it up or down you get an answer and you got up you might think it was up all the way from the packing house to here because I got an up answer but that is wrong that it is possible to prepare an electron and put it in a box so that on that day when you make that measurement you can actually get up or down an electron is doing both at the same time. This is how quantum computers work ordinary computers if you look at them inside their guts they got some bits they are either 0 or 1 0 or 1 and the computer plots through the configuration by configuration changing zeros into ones and ones into zeros, but a quantum computer would have things which can be 0 and 1 at the same time and if you got 10 different bits called qubits or quantum bits they will be doing 2 to the power 10 things at the same time that is why quantum computers can do things that other things cannot do they are parallel processing many configurations at the same time ok. So, what I have realized then the summary of everything I have told you is everything Yogi said applies to some basic physics principle. So, my plan was to really milk it for what it is worth and actually uh, maybe make the next big prediction in physics by looking at one of Yogi's quotations and seeing what he could possibly mean. So, here is another one I thought I had a hold on it, but it is already been taken and it is the following it turns out there are particles of the world are divided into two families they are either bosons or they are fermions the electron is a fermion and the photon I talked about is a boson the proton is a fermion the pion is a boson. So, anyway they fall into two families and bosons have the property that they are very sociable they go to a room they find three bosons doing something they will do the same thing more likely to do that than doing something different. Fermions are exactly the opposite they never want to do the same thing as another fermion that is why two electrons in the atom never do the same thing that is the basis for this story about two electrons that went to a bar and the first one said I want a dry martini the other says damn that is what I was going to have because they cannot do what the other guys do okay, that is a strict principle. So, I thought I will uh, do something with that then I found out that Yogi has already talked about that this, uh, this is the electron bar see. once an electron goes it is too much nobody else can go there ok. So, very last item I want to talk about has to do with going to the funeral right. So, you think that is funny well it turns out that that also happens in physics so, that is I will tell you what the yogi meant by the funeral it turns out according to the laws of quantum field theory particles can go forward in time they can also go backward in time the guys going backward in time are connected somehow with anti particles. So, look what happens here this particle is born here B is for born it goes through its future and it dies there. On that day this other guy is born goes backwards in time and comes and dies here 
that is allowed. So, this guy is at this guy's funeral, later on that guy is at this guy's funeral. So, <coughs> everything Yogi said is profound, I am working on it. In fact, uh, somebody asked Yogi, what time is it? And he said, you mean now? <laughs> so, so I am trying to find out what that means. So, I invite all of you to do the same. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Ah. Well, he's asking the following question: Are there any experiments that talk about hidden variables? So I should tell you a little bit what hidden variables are. So when you do the double slit experiment, and I release the electron, I say, I don't know where it's going to land when it hits the screen. It could be anywhere you can take the view that you don't know where it is going to land because you don't know everything. You think an electron just has a location and a mass and nothing else. In fact, that is most people's view of the electron see. That is the reason you can make predictions in physics is that we deal with things like electrons which have no personality. They do not have anything going on besides what we see. In fact, I was bragging to one of my friends who is a psychiatrist saying you know I can tell you with confidence that when I go to the top of a building and drop a brick and it's 64 feet tall, it will hit the ground in exactly 2 seconds. Can you say anything that precise about your patients? He said, yeah, if I go to the same building and throw my patient, <laughs> but that is not what they care about. See, they want to know why did I throw the patient, does it look like my father, that is what those guys are interested in. <laughs> but we are interested in things like electrons which have no other attributes besides what we see, but that is a feeling maybe there are hidden variables. Maybe there is wheels within wheels and that is why the wheels are set in one position one day that is where the electron lands here and another day it is set another way. Yeah, you can think about hidden variables and you can reconcile what you do experimentally and make sure no one doubts that the predictions of quantum mechanics are correct. That is why you have semiconductors and everything else based on that principle. It is a question of it is correct, but maybe there is more going on. To my knowledge, I am not an expert in this, my understanding is that if you build a formalism in which there are hidden variables and they can help you predict what will happen in an experiment, then you have to do one thing that is not allowed in by relativity. Namely, hidden variables here should talk to hidden variables there even though there is no time even to send a light signal from here to there. That means they would have to be communicating at a speed bigger than that of light and that is a violation. So, you have to pick one of the two bad options, either you violate the highest velocity or you can have hidden variables, so you feel you understand things better, but you cannot have it both ways. Yes, yeah, you sir, yeah. Which one? Oh, entanglement. Uh, yes, entanglement comes in when you have more than one particle you got one particle is what I have done. You got two particles, it is possible to create them in such a state that if you then eventually separate them and you make a certain measurement on this particle, then it seems to affect the outcome of what will happen when you study the other particle. Now, you got to be a little careful, some entanglement is very common even in classical mechanics. For example, suppose two guys rob a bank, yeah, they take a million bucks they run off in opposite directions. You catch one guy, he has got 300,000 bucks, you already know immediately the other one has 700,000 bucks. So, that is not an entanglement that you worry about. It is more that when you look at these electrons or two particles which are emitted at the same time in opposite directions, if you measure for example their spin, you can choose to measure the spin in various directions, namely up or down in this direction versus up or down in that direction. If I decide to measure up or down in this direction and I got up here, I can be sure that if you go there and you measure it will be down in that direction. That looks like the bank robber nothing funny, but the same electron you can on the very same day choose to measure it in the horizontal direction say east to west and if it is east to west the other guy will then be west to east. 
So, depending on you have not told anybody in which direction you plan to measure it and depending on what you measure on that day the other one will do the opposite it has not had any chance to really talk to this one or even know ahead of time what you are going to measure. That means their lives are entangled I mean they do seem to have some awareness of each other even over long distances that is a weird part of the quantum mechanics yes. No, they do not. So, in a sense, they do not communicate. They do not, they have no chance to be in any contact after a while. They have gone outside what we call the light cone. That means there is no way to talk from here to here. And yet, this is simply true about quantum mechanics. Before the particles are emitted, you are not telling anybody how are you going to line up your experimental apparatus. You decide in the last minute to do it this way. And depending on what answer you get here, you can predict the answer there. That is the funny part of, that is the non local part of entanglement. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Did you hear that joke? <laughs> I will repeat the joke. So Yogi was it's a nice joke. I mean I think I probably could not find a way to fit it in here, but it is a good joke. <laughs> so, he went to a pizza place and said uh, I want a pizza and they said should we cut it into 4 pieces or 8 pieces and he said 4 because I cannot eat 8. <laughs> I am sure if I think long enough I will tie it up to something maybe we can talk about this later. Yep. Well, you have answered yourself I mean look at all the people saying yes that is correct <laughs> and not only with other clintons. Yes. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Uh, you mean how real are the particles we observe? Yeah, or they just start back something else. Okay. Well, there are the first pragmatic view is the particles are pretty real. If they hit your detector, they are real. But that is a very interesting theory I should mention to you connected to my last slide. Why are so many electrons identical? Suppose you are making soap boxes or something, each one will be slightly different, even if you set your factory to be perfect. But every electron you find anywhere in the universe is identical to every other electron that is a great mystery by the way you should think about that that there are in nature entities which are absolutely and totally identical to other things ok. All electrons have the same mass the same charge the same everything anywhere in the universe so you can ask how did that happen. So, this is Feynman again our friend was talking to this his advisor John Wheeler about how come they are all the same. So, Wheeler had this following interesting idea. You, so, you take one electron you have it go forward in time then go backward in time and forward in time and backward in time large number of times. If you slice it at any one time this guy is going in and out of that one time slice it leaves behind many little punctures on your equal time plane and when it is going up you call it a particle when it is going down you call it an antiparticle. Now, it is no surprise that all these particles are the same because it is the same particle going forward and backward in time. So, if you admit the notion that things can go forward and backward and we do it is conceivable all the electrons you see is just one electron going back and forth back and forth many many times. So, at a given instant you think there is many of them ok <laughs> yes. Would the same results occur under different gravitational fields? Yeah uh, that is nothing special about gravitation Every, nothing I have said is going to change when you have force of gravity. Yep. Well, everything has to do with why we do not behave the way particles do according to laws of quantum mechanics. Uh, it has the same issue. For tiny particles, lots of things are possible, but for macroscopic objects, they are not possible. You have to propagate as a single quantum entity. If you can do it, you can go back and forth. 
but it is very hard for us to behave like quantum particles because we are constantly bombarded by other things from outside we are not isolated. But it is in principle it is possible for a very heavy object to go forward and backward in time it is correct. Basically I will tell you what it really is uh, suppose a uh, particle goes forward in time and comes back we do not see forward and backward we just go forward in time uniformly right. So, we will see two lines coming and meeting and disappearing that is the say the particle and antiparticle will meet and disappear and out comes a flash of light. So, it is certainly possible that is the event that we call as going backward in time it is just another way to do it mathematically you understand a particle going forward and bouncing back if you uniformly move forward in time is the same as the annihilation of a particle and antiparticle because you will see two things for a while and then you will see nothing beyond. So, it is possible to create a universe in which every single particle in it is the same as you except it is replaced by an antiparticle. I take every electron in you put an anti put a positron every proton I put an antiproton I can build another person exactly like you. Of course, when the two of you meet uh, you will disappear in a huge flash of gamma rays right, but that can formally be viewed as saying you went forward in time emitted a gamma ray. So, powerful you recoil backwards and started backward in time, but for us it is just the annihilation of you and your anti twin. So, it is not any mysterious thing it is the fact that particles and antiparticles when they meet and disappear it is the same as saying it either you can say two lines met and disappeared look at my hands or you can say one line went up and came down yes. Well, it is it defined in practical terms I mean if you go to somebody who works in, in our physics building they are able to manipulate individual electrons they are able to take them from here put them there move them around make little arrays of them. So, that is you can only talk about what you can do whether it means this or means that or whether something else is really going on in the background is really up for you to decide, but they behave very much like this I can take an electron like I can take this bag and take it from here and put it there. Is this bag a separate entity or part of a big mysterious cosmic thing? I do not know, but as far as I am concerned, I know how to deal with it on a daily basis as if it were an isolated thing. As long well, you have to tell me another way to calculate it in the other way. I know one way to calculate it where I treat it as a free, uh, free object and it seems to work. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, there are different kinds of physics done at Yale some people are looking for building quantum computers That's a big enterprise in physics and applied physics whose goal is to build a quantum computer. So, a quantum computer is so fast that certain calculations that will take a normal computer the age of the universe your computer can do in about 30 seconds, but you should not run out and throw your classical computers because the quantum computers right now do not have too many bits in them biggest one I know about is got 5 bits in it. So, you want to build eventually look here is a, if you if someone tells you what is so hard about a quantum computer why not take a lot of electrons each one is like a qubit line them up and shoot them to build your machine. Here is the conundrum it is not hard to explain you have all seen one thing I hope you will carry that in your mind for a quantum system to behave in this weird fashion you should not make any contact with it. On the other hand if you want to read out and put in data you got to have contact with it. You got to build a system that at some points in the game will allow you to have robust contact with it, other points will be perfectly isolated. That has been the problem. You can find things that have very little contact, so they behave quantum mechanically, doing many things at the same time for a long time, but you are not able to access them and change their fate. You are not able to write a program onto them, so they will do something. That some people are building quantum computers, slowly making them bigger, some people are looking for dark matter. If you look at the universe we have um, the amount of mass that we know is there is less than the amount of mass that we see. How can you have mass that you cannot see well suppose there is a gigantic planet sitting next to me all the mass of a planet squeezed into the size of this bottle trust me you and I will know about it every time I try to walk past it I will find myself bending over to the left. So, you can tell by your deflection there is something there attracting you. This one I can also see it because it 
transmits light and reflects light. But if it is made of dark matter, I won't see it, but I will feel its pull. That's how people deduce how much matter there is. But you don't seem to account for all the matter in form of visible matter. So there's a search going on for dark matter. We don't know anything about the factors other than the factors there. Is it made up of particles? Is it the jello you want? We don't know what it is, but we know it's there. We're trying to locate it. Then there are people working on uh, neutrino physics. Neutrinos are supposed to come from the sun at a certain rate. They were not found to arrive here at a certain rate. That was a big mystery. First, they blamed it on the people who did the calculation on solar neutrinos. Now they realize the calculations are right, except what happens is on the passage from the sun to the earth, one kind of neutrino changes into a different kind of neutrino. They metamorph during their passage. So if you looked at not the one that left the sun, but all the things you could have turned into, and you added them up, you get the right number. That's the neutrino physics. But it's very tricky because neutrinos usually can penetrate anything. You can line up 25 different planet Earths and a neutrino could go from one end to the other before it has a single collision. You want that guy to stop and say hello to you in your lab when your detector is that big. So it's, uh, it's very hard. The events are very freak, infrequent and rare, but they are working on building prototypes and bigger machines. Then there are the collider guys. That's going to happen next in uh, Geneva. The world's biggest particle collider is built in Geneva. The Americans, we, we pulled out of it when we decided not to build the one in Texas, which I think for eight, million, $8 billion was a super bargain because we're losing a lot of our credibility and our leadership because the action has now moved to Europe. They are looking for new particles. Where to find new particles is you smash them, and instead of mass turning into energy, as in an atom bomb, this energy turning into mass. And any possible mass that God created will appear in these collisions. If you hit them hard enough, new stuff will come out. You can make you and your anti-brother, if I can get enough energy in CERN. So right now we are aiming, our aims are more modest. We're looking for particles roughly 1,000 times heavier than the proton to be produced. Well, these are the different kind of some sample, I probably left some things out, but I didn't want to give too long an answer. Yeah, maybe I'll take this last question so you people can go back. Yes, you had a question? Yeah. Well, I made a promise I would not cry on stage, but I'll try to be unemotional. The status of basic research is, of course, uh, in bad shape. I think the policies are short-sighted. Basic research will never pay off in the short run. The time scale over which things pay off. Why did people study electrons going through a double slit? At the time they studied them, who cares? It doesn't translate into oil or gas or planes or anything. You study them because you want to know. Ten years later, you find that's how you make a semiconductor work, because electrons behave like waves. In a solid, you understand solid, you build semiconductors. But there is a time lag between basic research and the fruits of basic research. That time lag is much bigger than the four years for which any one person is in power or any Congress is in power. So you need a policy that transcends who are, I don't care, Republican, Democrat, I'm not interested. We're all Americans. We need a stability of funding so that when you start a big project, like the solar neutrino project took the Japanese a long time, and in fact, halfway through the detectors all exploded. It's a huge underwater tunnel. I mean, underwater mine where they did the experiment, and one bulb exploded and sent a shock wave, killed all of them. You don't say your funding is over. They funded it back, and the Japanese got a Nobel Prize out of it because the government stood behind the funding. So my view is basic research is something you just got to keep going because you maintain leadership, you attract people from all over the world because we are intellectual leaders, and that money is worth everything. So I hope that you will, in whatever capacity,